Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute uh, here in Philadelphia. And um, this morning we're doing a special briefing on a topic that has been in the news uh, of late on Alexei Navalny and uh, how that impacts uh, US-Russian relations. Um, it's been in the news, but all you're hearing really are headlines. So here's an opportunity to get the story behind the story and uh, which is what FPRI does best. Uh, moderating our event this morning uh, is Maya Otarashvili and our panelists are our are our uh, FPRI's head of our Eurasia program, Chris Miller, and Stephanie Petrella, who does a great deal for FPRI as well. Um, let me just say a few words about Maya, who many of you know. She's a uh, she's the director of our deputy director of our Eurasia program and the deputy director of uh, FPRI. <laughs> FPRI's entire research program, as well as an FPRI research fellow. She's a PhD candidate at the War Studies Department at King's College London, and she holds an MA in Globalization, Development and Transition from the University of Westminster in London. She's also co-editor of FPRI's 2017 volume, Does Democracy Matter? The United States and Global Democracy Support. Uh, she's currently examining the post-Soviet frozen conflicts of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Transnistia. Uh, before I turn the reins over to Maya, uh, just uh, a reminder that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, uh, preferably not the chat because we'll be looking for them in the Q&A and sometimes we miss them if you put them in the chat. Um, in the chat box, we'll also put maps, links to maps if um, as, as appropriate to the discussion and a link to FPRI's website as well. Um, so if you have any technical problems, tell us about those in the chat too, because we will we will try to help you if, if you're having some issues. There will also be a recording of this, a video recording of it, which we'll be posting on our website and sending out probably later today, uh, but in any case, within 24 hours. Uh, finally, thank you to all of our supporters and members and our board members who are on the call. Um, we can't do this without you and we are very, very grateful. So let me turn it over to Maya. Thank you so much, Raleigh. Um, we appreciate you chairing this event today. Um, so let me set the stage just a, a little bit. As most of you know, uh, on January 23rd, thousands of uh, protesters took to the streets across Russia in support of Alexei Navalny, who is one of the country's most prominent political opposition leaders and an outspoken critic of, of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Um, the protests went over for days and led to thousands of arrests, which we've been watching in the news for for quite some time. Um, and the protests were spread out in nearly 100, town, 100 towns and cities in, in Russia. Um, so this garnered quite a bit of international attention. What were they protesting over um, is uh, Navalny's arrest. Um, again, as most of you know, Navalny was uh, poisoned uh, back in August and uh, barely survived that, that poisoning. Um, he was airlifted uh, and, and recovered in Germany and he returned to Moscow um, and was arrested at, at the passport control at the airport immediately. Um, so that has really sparked a, a lot of um, international outrage and discussion. Uh, just this past Tuesday, Navalny was sentenced to 2.8 years in, in prison uh, by Russian courts. Um, we've seen um, anyone from the U United States to the European Union condemn uh, Rus the Russian government for imprisoning Navalny and, and for uh, imprisoning these uh, protesters. So there's quite a bit to discuss today um, and we're joined 
joined uh, by the, the right people for this. Uh, Chris Miller, most of you know him. He is the director of our Eurasia program. Stephanie Petrella is the editor in chief of our BMB Russia. Uh, if you're not subscribed to it, you, you have to look into that on, on our website, fpri.org, uh, because um, I, I, don't, I cannot imagine if I didn't get the, the newsletter um, multiple times a week, I don't think I would ever feel like I'm, I'm as caught up with everything that is happening uh, in Russia. And Stephanie does such a great job with, with, uh, with the newsletter. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Stephanie first because I want to talk a little bit more about Navani, um, tell our audience a little bit more about him, his background, his track record. He's a rather controversial person. And then I'll go over to Chris. Obviously we have a new administration in the United States. So uh, the big question on everyone's mind is what will the Biden administration's uh, Russia policy look like? So we will definitely address that as well. And then later on, we will go into Q&A. So please do send in your questions. I'm going to try to get to as many of them as possible. So Stephanie, um, tell us a little bit more about Alexei Navalny. Um, what you know what he's been up to for all these years um and i don't know if you know the number of times he has already been arrested but uh, it will it will be helpful to talk about also why he is so controversial uh within russia but outside russia as well yeah certainly thanks maya so i think that there's a tendency in russia especially within the power circles to majorly underplay navalny's achievements and I think that there's a tendency in the United States and in the West more broadly to overplay Navalny's achievements. So I think one way, um, the best way to look at him is to look at objectively, you know, what has he done? What has he accomplished? What are the main strategies that he's using to oppose Putin? So Navalny has been in politics um, for about two decades now, since the early 2000s. He uh, was originally part of the Yablica party, which he left in 2007. Um, but there, I think there are two ways to look at Navalny and his activities. The first is Navalny, the anti-corruption activist. Um, and so in that role, he and his team released these investigations into corruption by Russian officials and into their massive amounts of illicit wealth. Um, the second way to look at him is as Navalny, the politician. So someone who has tried to run for office and when he's unable to run for office has created a system to try to oust the ruling United Russia party and get opposition, true opposition candidates into office. Um, and in both of these areas, uh, Navalny started gaining prominence, I would say in about 2011. So two important things happened in 2011. Um, the first was that he created the Anti-Corruption Foundation, which is his nonprofit organization that currently runs all of these corruption investigations that I mentioned. Um, and the second thing was that he, started the phrase that United Russia was the party of crooks and thieves. And that phrase really caught on. Um, it's something that if anyone says the party of crooks and thieves in Russia, everyone knows that you're talking about United Russia. Um, and he began this political campaign telling people during the 2011 parliamentary elections to vote for any party other than United Russia. Just they're crooks and thieves, don't vote for them. And you could see, call that sort of the roots of his uh, smart voting system, which is the, the project that he's currently running um, in the political sphere. So just to give a little bit more background on both his anti-corruption investigations and then his political activities, uh, I'll start with the anti-corruption activities. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, the Russian state media likes to really underplay Navalny's role in Russian politics. And they often do that by A, not really naming him, um, but B, also they like to, when they have to refer to him, call him, um, you know, our blogger. And the reason for that is because Navalny started with a, a live journal blog. So in the um, mid 2000s into about 2011, he had this live journal blog where he was investigating um, corruption in state contracts, um, corruption. One of his first investigations was into Transneft. Um, and then after he started this anti-corruption foundation in 2011, he started releasing these more you know, polished documentary features into officials uh, corruption. So the first major one came out in 2015. Um, it was about Russia's prosecutor general at the time, Yuri Chaika, and his um, criminal connections. Basically, the, the documentary alleged that he is from a crime family. Um, and so that had about 5 million views at the time, which was a lot. But, you know, if you look at the total population of Russia, that's still a small portion. Um, the next major investigation came out in 2016, and that was into Igor Shuvalov, who was the deputy prime minister at the time, and he now runs Russia's main economic development bank. And so this 
looked into um, his corgis that his wife takes on private jets to international dog shows and all the luxury apartments that he has in Moscow. Um, and then the kind of the biggest hit that Navalny had leading up to the, the Putin's palace investigation that was just released was in 2017 when he released an investigation into the massive wealth that then Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev had accumulated. And so it had this great drone footage of, of Medvedev's villas and wineries and all these dachas, if you want to call them that, in the countryside. Um, and this was one of the first investigations that Navalny's team released that it racked up about 30 million views on YouTube, which was a lot at the time. Um, and it, it started mass protests, um, mass unsanctioned protests. Um, and so a lot of people see this as kind of the beginning of Medvedev's downfall. Um, and that was the, the latest anti-corruption investigation until he just recently, you know, the, the latest big one until he just recently released a, um, a bombshell investigation into Putin's $1.3 billion um, palace that he has on the Black Sea, which as you can imagine, it was it was viewed by over 100 million people and prompted a lot of outrage within Russia. So that's one side of Navalny's activities is really he's an anti-corruption investigative journalist. He has a team that does these investigations and then publishes them online. And over the years, they've gained more and more traction because they've also started targeting bigger and bigger players. Um, the other side of Navalny's activities is Navalny the politician. So as I mentioned in 2011, he called United Russia the party of crooks and thieves. Um, and he began this campaign to vote for anyone other than United Russia. And this was, um, you know, the 2011 parliamentary elections was one of the first major tests for United Russia. They had to rig the vote in the Duma um, and then they still lost their constitutional majority. So it was this, it was these elections that started the, sparked the uh, Bolotnaya protests, which Navalny was one of several organizers of. So he, he wasn't the main figure. There was also Boris Nemtsov, Garry Kasparov, um, Mikhail Kasyanov, and a few other figures. But this is where he started kind of gaining prominence within Russia. Um, and so after, you know, kind of riding the momentum from that, that experience in 2013, he ran for mayor of Moscow. And he came in second place. Um, it was him against Sergei Sobyanin and then a bunch of candidates from the Communist Party, Yabloka, you know, LDPR. And he almost, what was really noticeable, notable about this election was that he almost forced a runoff. Um, so he won 27% of the vote, which was more than all of the other opposition candidates combined. And um, Sergei Sobyanin, the mayor of Moscow, won 51%. So had Navalny won just a tiny bit more, that would have forced a runoff, which I think to the authorities was a really noticeable, like we, we need to take this guy seriously because that could start causing a lot of trouble. Um, so after that, Navalny tried to run for president in 2018. Um, he created a series of campaign offices, one in every Russian region um, to try to you know, stimulate the vote. Um, but the, the authorities decided that it was not wise to let him run. So he was unable to register as a candidate. Um, but 2018 is when he started the system that is currently the main focus of Navalny's team in the political sphere. And this is their smart voting system. Um, so the smart voting system really builds off of what Navalny said in 2011, which was vote for anyone other than United Russia. So the way smart voting works is that they have a website. You go on their website and you type in, I live here in this district, and they coordinate the opposition vote. So they say, okay, if you don't want to vote for United Russia, this is the person you should vote for. Everyone who hates United Russia is going to vote for this person, and that's going to give them the greatest chance of potentially ousting the United Russia candidate. Um, and so the main goal here is that United Russia has a monopoly. There's no political competition in Russia. But if we're able to gradually erode this monopoly, then even though the people who were voting in are from the Communist Party or for, from LDPR, you know, eventually as they gain more power, power they'll say like, why, why do we have to cooperate with the Kremlin and United Russia when we have a big enough faction that we can start kind of pushing for our own ideas as well. So the idea there is that you break this monopoly and you generate political competition. So this is currently the focus of Navalny's team. Um, they've had some successes with the smart voting system, but it is really new. So it, the, the two times it's been tested so far were in the 2019 um, local elections and then the 2020 local elections. 
And in 2019, they had some success in Moscow and they had some success in the far eastern region of Khabarovsk, um, where LDPR, the Liberal, Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, that's neither liberal nor democratic, but um, they, they gained a majority of the, the Duma seats in that region. Um, and then last year in 2020, they had some success in Novosibirsk and in Tomsk, which are you know, two regions in Russia where they were able to um, kind of break United Russia's monopoly in the uh, regional Dumas. But it's still a really new system. Um, so the, the authorities are trying to work out how to, how to um, get around that. And it's also a controversial system because a lot of the opposition candidates that smart voting is advocating for, you know, aren't necessarily attractive candidates themselves. So I think a lot of people have a hard time voting for whichever LDPR or Communist Party candidate who maybe on paper looks worse than the United Russia candidate. But the smart voting system is, is going to be um, the main focus of Navalny's team and particularly going into the 2021 Duma elections. And that's been that's their main focus right now. Thank you, Stephanie. Before I move over to Chris, there is a question that I actually myself I'm really interested in hearing the answer. Do you know um, how Navalny is financed he and his movement? Yeah, so I believe his movement is financed by mostly donations from Russians. I actually I, I looked on their website the other day because one of the main refrains in Russian state media is on one hand, it's it's contradictory. On one hand, he's just a little blogger who is not significant and doesn't have any name recognition. And on the other hand, he's an enemy of the Russian state who's financed by the Western security services and is cooperating with them and releasing information from the CIA to damage Russia as a country. Um, but I was looking on their website and actually, so um, the Anti-Corruption Foundation, it doesn't accept um, donations from outside of Russia, at least for ordinary donations. I don't know if there are um, civil society grants that they get I, I imagine that there are, but just from people, the, the bulk of their donations come from within Russia, but they have been labeled as a foreign agent. Um, mm -hmm. But foreign agent laws in Russia have been expanded pretty widely in recent right. recent months and years. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I, Chris, I, I want to um, ask you, uh, so we know uh, Biden, the Biden administration has condemned um, all, all the drama around uh, Navalny's arrest, um, and uh, just you know, in response to to his sentencing, uh, Biden said that the that Washington will no longer be rolling over in the face of Russia's aggressive actions. Um, but what does that mean in practice? What do you expect um, US-Russia relations will look like? What are some of the biggest themes that we should keep an eye out for as, as we move forward? Yeah, thanks Maya for, for sharing this discussion. And it's a, a great question and I think a fascinating one. And this is interesting timing um, with Navalny's uh, arrest and imprisonment coming in. I think it's, we're still in week three of the Biden administration. Um, I think a couple of things to, to sort of frame how the administration is likely to look at this. The first is that when you think of, of Biden's priorities, Russia is probably not near the top of his list. I mean, A, we've got domestic issues like the pandemic and, and the economic aftershocks. But then B, even on the foreign policy front, uh, it, it seems pretty plausible that other issues are, are, are further up uh, the priority list than Russia. China is obviously one example, but also relations with U.S. partners and allies in, in Europe and Asia and elsewhere. So it, it, it's not immediately clear that Russia is going to be dominating uh, how President Biden spends his time when he's thinking about foreign policy issues. Uh, when, when he does think about Russia, I think it's also worth noting that the, the first step that Biden took when it came to Russia was actually to uh, extend a, a nuclear arms control agreement, the New START agreement, which uh, is, I think, actually scheduled to expire today, um, but is in the process of being extended um, for, for five more years. Um, and this is actually, I think, worth worth noting because al although the a lot of the rhetoric out of the Biden administration is um, is, is quite hawkish on Russia, actually the first step was um, to do something uh, that that Russia had been asking for for a long time, which was to extend this arms control treaty. So uh, you, you sort of have a, an interesting mix of um, negative rhetoric, but um, um, a, a step that is 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 supportive of, of better relations between uh, the two countries, or at least a step that will make the Kremlin. Um, 
uh, uh, happy or, or more satisfied with with Biden than they were with Trump. Um, and so, so then the question is, well, what do they do about Navalny in particular? And I, I think the first thing is, uh, anything they do is is probably unlikely to have any sort of tangible effect on Navalny himself. The, the Kremlin clearly sees him as a mortal threat, which is why uh, somebody ordered him to be assassinated this this fall. Uh, and so in, in that context, it, it's really hard to change Kremlin decision making uh, if, in fact, the Russian security services or Putin personally see Navalny as someone so dangerous that he's worth killing. Um, so I, I think any sort of U.S. response is, is going to take place knowing that it's not going to change how Russia makes decisions about Navalny in a, in a major way. Um, so what will the U.S. do? I, I think it's certainly plausible we're going to have more statements of, of the type that we've already had from top U.S. leaders condemning Navalny's imprisonment. Um, we've seen similar statements from uh, European leaders as well. Uh, there's been some discussion of uh, new sanctions from Washington, both in Congress and in the administration. Um, but, but most of the discussions thus far have actually been uh, about sanctions that would be relatively limited uh, in their scope. Certainly, um, a very little discussion of, of the types of sanctions that we saw in, in 2014 uh, during the invasion of Ukraine or, or even uh, in, in 2018 when a, a number of uh, very um, influential Russian oligarchs were sanctioned. So it does seem like the, the sanctions tool is not going to be used particularly aggressively. Uh, on this front. There might be some sanctions, but they'll probably be relatively targeted and, and won't have a big sort of macro effect on, 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 on Russian politics or, or the Russian economy. Um, I think the, the, the other facet of the Biden administration's policy towards Russia is, is going to be focusing on, on, on what's commonly known in Washington as, as sort of the anti-kleptocracy front. Uh, and, and the view here is that um, Russian leaders are, or at least certain Russian leaders are, are focused on um, on, on hiding their money abroad in, in Western financial markets, including in U.S. financial markets, and that by taking steps to provide for more transparency, uh, tighten money laundering rules, uh, we can make it harder to uh, shift money abroad um, and, and therefore impose some sort of costs on Russian leaders. And I, I think it's hard to argue with uh, tightening rules on anti-money laundering as a, as a policy goal, so I, I wholeheartedly endorse that. But I think it's worth asking a question of, will that uh, shape Russian uh, leaders' behavior on on these issues, uh, and, and again, I, I I point to the, the the level of risk that the the Russian leadership sees in Navalny. If it's if it's worth assassinating someone uh, in your view because he's so dangerous to your hold on power, it's not obvious that tightening rules around where you can move money is necessarily going to uh, change your calculus. Um, so I, I think the one the one the one exception to that might be that uh, more Western attention on the Navalny case. Um, could prevent a, a further assassination attempt on him. Uh, it could potentially have some sort of effect in lessening the uh, treatment he gets in prison, um, making sure he, he, he isn't uh, abused at least too much, although he's already been abused so much over the past couple of years in, in any number of different ways. Um, but given that the Kremlin sees him as, as clearly a mortal threat uh, to the regime, it, it's actually not obvious that we have uh, an extraordinary amount of leverage um, on, on how they actually approach the Navalny threat. Chris, thank you so much. I, I also want to um, go into, obviously Navalny's arrest uh, brings up these questions about, okay, in September we have uh, the Duma elections and then in 2025, I believe Russia will have its presidential election. Um, today they, there is the hearing uh, on another uh, charge for Navalny. So there is a chance on a defamation case. So there is a chance that they could add more time to his sentence, which would uh, keep him in prison uh, beyond the, the point of, of the presidential election. So that, that might also um, be helpful to, to the current regime. Uh, but going into, I, I know 2025 seems like, uh, you know, very far away, but um, not quite, right? So what what are we anticipating? How do we expect that that election will will take place? And also, without Navalny, with Navalny in prison, um, do you think that the, his movement will will have as much effect um, in terms, especially in terms of really organizing people throughout Russia and and uh, you know bringing them out to the street? Well, on the Navalny question, it seems implausible that he'd be allowed to run in twenty in the next election. 
um, given that he wasn't allowed to run the last one and he's going to be in prison for the next couple of years. I mean, obviously at the end of the day, it's not a legal question. It's a, a question for, for President Putin as to whether he's allowed to run. Um, but it just seems highly unlikely that, that they would run that risk. Uh, so then the question is, yeah, could, could his movement sustain um, its, its, uh, its, its impact and, and potentially even field a candidate? And, and there too, uh, it, it seems like the decision has been made in the Kremlin that it, it should be suppressed in every way possible. Um, we've seen a number of Kremlin-connected oligarchs um, bringing lawsuits against Navalny's foundation. Um, we've obviously seen uh, the arrests of, of many of the key leaders. Uh, and this isn't new, but we've seen uh, increasing pressure on family members of key leaders of Navalny's organizations, which is something that's uh, existed in, in the past, but I think is, it's fair to say has intensified in the past couple of months. Um, so it, it does seem like the Kremlin is committed to doing everything they can to shut it down. Um, now, I think the big question is, if you arrest the key leadership, does that shut down the, the, the movement? And I think that's, uh, it's almost certainly the case that the answer is partly yes, that the leaders really do matter. Um, but I don't think that it's wholly yes, um, because a lot of the protesters that I think we've seen over the past uh, two weeks in Russia are, are not necessarily coming out for Navalny personally, or even want him to be president necessarily. They're coming out because they think it's, 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 it's unjust that, uh, that the government or, or parts of the state tried to kill him, uh, and they don't want to live underneath that type of system. And it's not obvious that if you put any number of people in jail that that protest sentiment disappears. Now, does it get harder to organize? I think, I think it probably does. Does it get harder to push it in, in certain politically useful directions? I think it does, um, but it's not going to, to disappear necessarily. And I think that means for the, the Kremlin, they're going to fear Navalny, even if they've neutered him as a political force. And I think, you know, as Stephanie was saying, the irony is that they were already doing a reasonably effective job of that. Uh, they had already basically banned him from running in elections. They'd already um, limited the ability of his party to function. Uh, they were, Navalny was never going to win an election even before the assassination attempt. Uh, and it's looking even less likely now, but the level of fear among Russian policymakers of Navalny is substantially higher than I think uh, any sort of realistic as assessment of, of how much fear they ought to have would suggest. And, and that, that I think to me Im implies that they're going to be continuing to try to push uh, very heavily against Navalny or anyone uh, associated with him, even if, uh, in fact, he no longer represents or, or his movement no longer represents a serious threat to their hold on power. Thank you, Chris. Um, I have a couple of really good questions uh, from our audience, so I want to uh, encourage everyone to send in their questions. I'm going to try to get to as many of, of them as I can. Um, one of the questions asks, um, again, the, the, the tie to the, the new um, Biden administration, did Navalny deliberately wait until Biden took office to release his documentary um, in hopes that Biden would you know, pay attention to him and, and help him um, you know, avoid his arrest? Um, another question uh, is about who else is in Navalny's movement who could potentially be seen as a leader? Um, uh, you know, are there any names that are, are standing out? So maybe, uh, Stephanie, I'll ask you to answer these two and then I'll get to the rest of the questions. Sure. Um, so in terms of Naval the timing of Navalny's return, I, I don't think it was a coincidence. Um, and that was actually one of the arguments that the court made when um, they sentenced him to two years and eight months in prison, which was that he was discharged from the hospital in Berlin after recovering from the poisoning um, in September, on September 23rd. And, and the argument was, which was valid that Navalny made, which was that, you know, he wasn't fully recovered at that point and wasn't able to travel. He couldn't walk. Um, but he did come back to the, back to Russia just like three days before Biden was in office. And I think you also have to think about in the context of US politics, which was, there was a period of time, especially after the Capitol insurrection where like, it, you know, it was a little bit up in the air exactly how the next few weeks were gonna play out. So I, I don't think that the timing of Navalny's return was um, a coincidence and his, um, the head of his regional, his campaign offices actually pretty much confirmed that yesterday when they announced that they're not going to hold any more protests um, following his imprisonment until this spring. Um, and when someone asked, well, what does that mean for Navalny? Like, how is he going to get out of prison? They said, we're gonna use foreign policy methods to get him out. And that was their answer. Um, they know that, that the Biden administration, uh, especially with some of the key people that he's appointed to run the State Department, um, they know that they 
have an interest in Russia and are supporters of, you know, challenging the Putin regime. So I think the Navalny team was hopeful that um, with the Biden administration in power that he would have a better chance of potentially being released. Um, your second question as to the leaders who have emerged recently. Um, so I think one thing that, and Chris sort of already mentioned this, was that, you know, Navalny at this point has a very strong he has, he's, he's built a system. Um, so he has his anti-corruption foundation and he has his campaign offices that they never closed after the um, his 2018 presidential run, despite the fact that he wasn't able to, to end up getting on the ballot. Um, so a few of the key leaders there that have also during Navalny's arrest really emerged as key figures are um, Lyubov Sobol, who ran for the Moscow City Duma elections in 2019 and was not allowed on the ballot again. So that, that kind of um, prompt wrote, led her to rise in prominence. Um, you have Grigory Alborov, who is at the, also at the Anti-Corruption Foundation and um, has been a really key figure in these recent investigations and particularly in the Putin's palace investigation. Um, and then in terms of Navalny's political apparatus, um, Leonid Volkov is one of the main figures. He's the head of that network of regional offices. Um, unfortunately, Volkov is currently abroad. Uh, he left Russia because it was clear that he was going to be put in prison for a long time if he stayed there. So he's operating from outside of Russia at this point. Um, then you also have Kira Yarmush, who's um, Navalny's press secretary and has gained a lot of prominence, prominence particularly on Twitter um, since Navalny's return and arrest. She was actually with him when he got poisoned on the same flight, which attracted a lot of attention to her. Um, and then the last person I would say also is that um, Navalny's wife, Yulia Navalnaya, has really been, you know, she's really attracted a lot of attention and people, um, I think people are really impressed by her and the way that she's stood by Navalny throughout it all, despite the fact that he's gotten arrested countless times, he's gotten poisoned, she was still there on the plane back to Russia with him and, you know, understands, she, she's said multiple times that she really supports his work and no matter what the Russian state throws at him, she doesn't want him to stop his work. And she was at both of the protests over the past two weekends to hopefully secure his release, which didn't end up working, but she got arrested as well, along with these other members of his team. Um, so I think a lot of people are looking to her too for sort of leadership in this situation right now. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, but you know, we have plenty more questions coming in specifically about Navalny. Um, I thought we would switch more over to US-Russia relations, but let's ask the rest of these questions. I, you know, is Navalny perceived as, um, you know, the men in the street or a, as a credible presidential candidate as an alternative to Putin? Chris touched on that, but maybe we could expand a little bit. Another one is actually, this is another issue we should talk about a little bit more. What tools, sanctions, or other actions can the U.S. use uh, with realistic effect to respond to continued Russian uh, bad treatment of Navalny, but also just, um, you know, the the assault on on uh, these basic freedoms within uh, within Russia? Um, so, Chris, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about this. Um, and I think this is such a good question. I just want to add really quickly that um, as the Biden administration sort of issues these um, stricter statements and condemns Russia, Russian behavior, the Russians are responding saying this is a, a very blunt intervention into our uh, domestic um, political processes and it's entirely inappropriate. Um, maybe you could comment on that as well. Sure, thanks, Maya. Um, I'll start with is, is Navalny, um, how, how is he seen by the man on the street? I, I think it's a really complicated question. Um, you know, as, as Stephanie mentioned at the outset, Navalny is not really allowed on state TV channels and the Russian state monopolizes all, all TV and has a really profound effect on, on radio and um, on, on many newspapers and, and even to a, a growing extent online. So the Russian media environment is, 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 is very highly unfriendly to Navalny. He is usually ignored and when he's not ignored he's he's treated as a, a CIA asset or a foreign funded rabble rouser so the, the man on the street um, gets a, a very skewed picture of Navalny if, if, if they've heard of him at all um, that said it, it, it does seem like where Navalny is able to get his message through he's able to attract a fair amount of popularity I mean it's it's, it's impossible to get any sort of 
quantitative sense in terms of public opinion polls um, that would be accurate in the absence of, of the, the censorship and the, the skewed media coverage that he gets. And that, that's ultimately an interesting question is if there were to be a free election with free media coverage, how would different candidates do? That's a, an impossible question to answer just given uh, the data that we have. But what we can say is that Navalny's done um, a really successful job in raising his own profile as someone um, who is an opponent of Putin's. And, and as Stephanie said, he's really the, the most well-known leader of, of the different opposition movements and has been extraordinarily successful in leveraging social media uh, and increasingly YouTube um, to, to, to push his message. So, um, so, so how does that feed into the, the, the guy in the street and how they view Navalny? Well, I think it depends which guy in the street you're talking to. It depends a lot on where they get their news from. Uh, if you get your news from state TV, you're, you're going to be very heavily inclined to have a negative opinion of Navalny. If you get your news from, uh, from the internet, you're going to be much more likely to have a positive um, uh, assessment of Navalny. So that's, that's a huge thing. Um, but also there's um, big distinctions, um, I, I would argue, between different, um, different regions as well. We've seen historically that Navalny gets the bulk of his support from bigger cities. Uh, and, and one of the impressive things that he's done in the past couple of years is really expand this nationwide uh, network of offices, but even still that the bulk of the support is, is in bigger cities um, as well. So, so th there's not, I, I don't think, one man on the street that we can turn to to ask for uh, their views on Navalny. You need to kind of differentiate among, among different demographic groups. But, uh, and, and that makes it hard to actually assess the question of how popular is Navalny. And the answer is, well, it kind of depends on, on, on who you ask. Um, my and your question of, of sanctions, it's a really interesting question, and it's 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 a hard one to answer as, as to what effect they could have. I mean, we have historical examples of this. For example, uh, during the the Soviet Union, uh, the U.S. repeatedly put um, sanctions on the Soviet Union with regards to grain purchases and attendance at the Olympics and things like that, uh, uh, connected with individual dissidents and also with. Uh, the Soviet Union's uh, decision for a long time not to let Jews leave the country. Uh, and I think it's impossible to argue that these, these sanctions at the time didn't have an effect. They clearly did have an effect. They were constant subjects of conversation between U.S. and Soviet leaders. And, uh, and, and we know that they played into Soviet decision making um, about Saharov personally and, and about the, the question of Jewish emigration. Um, it's, it's a different question to ask, were they effective? Um, because then you need to think about, well, what's the time horizon and what are, what, are the, what are the alternatives? And I think in the case of the Soviet Union, if you want to argue that sanctions work, you have to argue they worked over a really long time frame. Um, so Saharov was um, harassed by the authorities for two or three decades before he was finally released. Uh, that's a really long time horizon um, over, over which to have efficacy. Um, maybe you could argue that that the, the question of Jewish immigration was resolved slightly faster, but even still it was a question of, of many years rather than an immediate effect. And, and when we today discuss whether sanctions on Russia are working, which is a question that's always asked in Washington, people mean, are they working this month or next month or by the end of the year? And I think history suggests that if if you want to take the view that sanctions work, you've got to be thinking over a timeline of decades rather than um, of, of, of months. And, and that's, that's not, a, I think, a message that, um, that comports well with either the Russian or the American political calendars. But, but I think that kind of is the, the historical lesson. So, so if you're asking what tools does, does the US or the West have to get Navalny out of jail this month, I, I'm, I'm, I'm rather skeptical that, that those tools um, exist. Uh, certainly, we've had every Western political leader call for Navalny's release. It's not that that's had um, any effect. And, and I return to the, the question of if you're in the Kremlin and you think uh, Navalny is, is worth assassinating, are you going to release him from jail just because um, a, a Western leader issued angry statements or sanctioned one of your friends? Um, you know, it, it's not obvious that that's going to change your calculus if, you, in fact, you think he's as threatening as people in the Kremlin evidently uh, think he is. Um, so that's that's where I think we should we should ask questions about sanctions efficacy, um, and if we want to think about them as as, as a long term strategy, there's I think a, a stronger argument to be made that the long term is, is is not the end of 2021. It's it's probably far longer than that. Thank you, Chris. Um, I have um, I want to couple these uh, two questions together. Um, I have a question about uh, succession planning, essentially, right? Again, in 2025, we have a presidential election coming up. Uh, 
Putin is 68 years old, which by no measure is, is too old, especially if you compare that to the um, you know, ages of um, American leaders, um, anywhere from the White House to the Senate. Uh, but um, this question, for example, says, isn't it calm, isn't it true that Russia has no history or track record of an outsider um, coming in, someone like Navalny or his supporters uh, to gain power always has been somebody with a position within the government. Um, in other words, it will have to be a regional leader or parliament member who takes the, the mantle. And I think the taking the mantle part of this is really important, meaning, um, you know, I don't think anyone here expects that someone surprising and, and brand new would come in. It would have to be a person of whom Putin at least approves and grooms for the position. But um, again, may, maybe not, right? He's very likely to run again. Um, but um, Stephanie, maybe some of your thoughts on this and, and Chris, you as well. Yeah, the, the question of Putin's succession plans is always a popular one. Um, right now, I mean, you mentioned he is 68. Um, he's in great health, if you've seen the photos of him swimming. Um, so the, I mean, the consensus right now is that he doesn't plan to leave power at any point um, in the near future. So in 2024, he is very likely going to run again. That was the whole gist of the constitutional reform that happened last spring into summer was that um, they changed the wording around term limits. So it's about consecutive term limits as opposed to um, it, basically using some technicalities, they zeroed his term limits so he can start again, he can run in 2024 um, and stay in power until 2036. So with a, another election in between in um, 2030. So the, you know, the consensus right now is that that's what Putin's plan is. There's obviously been some, um, you know, speculation that he's creating other institutions that maybe he could leave the presidency to go to and um, transform the state council into, a, you know, a more of a, a powerful position where he could lead the state council and thereby stay in charge of Russia, despite not being the president anymore. Um, I think that ultimately we have to wait and see, but I, I wouldn't expect Putin to go anywhere. And I think the reason for that is that, you know, it's pretty well documented, you know, partially through Navalny's investigations, but also just its general knowledge that Putin has committed crimes in office. He's stolen a lot of money and, and there's no guarantee that he's going to stay, stay free and, you know, be able to maintain that wealth after if he fully relinquishes power to someone else. Um, but it is true that generally in the, you know, Russian history, aside from, I guess, the example of the um, Russian Revolution in 1917, um, that Russian regimes have fallen because of um, defections of the elite. And um, so I think that the key indicator here to see whether you know, what Putin's future plans are, discussions within the elite, you know, are the elite lo losing faith in Putin? Are they starting to think, you know, maybe this, maybe he's not our guy, maybe we need to turn to someone else and put someone who might be a little bit more popular and isn't as controversial and hasn't been in power for so long. Um, so I think once those conversations, once you start hearing more about that, then you can um, think a little bit more about what might come after Putin. But for right now, we're not seeing those conversations. Um, and just really quickly with regards to sanctions, I think the hope is that by sanctioning individuals who are close to the regime, the, the oligarchs and other security officials and taking away their ability to go vacation in the south of France, you know, maybe those individuals will say, you know, this isn't worth it. Why don't we put someone else in power who the US and EU don't have such a problem with and then our lives can kind of go back to normal. Um, so that's the hope, but so far we haven't seen any signs that that's actually happening. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I have a question for you, Chris, from our former president, Alan Luxemburg. I'm so glad he's in the audience. It's a rather provocative question. So he says, Chris mentioned that Russia is not on the top of Biden's priorities, but one issue that is on top of Biden's agenda is domestic extremism. I'm wondering if you can address the ties between far right extremists in the US with individuals or institutions in Russia, such as the Russia Imperial Movement and what might Biden do to deal with um, such ties? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I, mean, I, I think the, the honest answer is that we're still learning about 
um, ties between uh, Russian groups and, and potentially the Russian government, although I think we still don't have a lot of great data points and uh, far right groups in the US. Um, we've certainly learned a lot over the past five years about Russian government efforts and the Russian security services efforts um, to build up a presence uh, in, uh, in, in US social media sites, for example. Uh, and so it, it wouldn't, I don't think be that surprising if there were also um, uh, efforts to, uh, to establish contact with far right groups in, in the US, um, especially given the prominence that they've had in, in American politics over the past couple of years. Um, but as to the actual substance of, of what those ties look like, I, I think the honest answer is we, we really don't know a lot right now. There are some um, suggestive ties. I think we ought to, we, we ought to assume that there are some, there's some sort of contact, um, but the, the depth of that contact uh, and how meaningful it is, I think we just don't know. Um, I, I would be cautious of ascribing too much causal power to Russia's interest in ties to far right groups. Uh, I, I, I suspect that the causes emerge from the US, which obviously has a very long history of, of, of right wing militias um, that, that, that give plenty of um, um, explanation on their own to, to why we have um, these groups uh, kind of reemerging again today. Um, but certainly it's plausible that there, that there are Russian efforts to bolster them, maybe some financing. Um, but, but I think we're going we're gonna to learn more, I would guess, over the next couple of years. Um, but I think beyond um, that, I think the interesting story is, is, is actually that, you know, although we, we've seen in the past couple of years, Russian efforts to support Texan and California independence movements, um, both of which are reasonably well documented, um, you know, that hasn't actually amounted to all, all that much. Um, and so I, I think there's a danger and just as the Russian government uh, is, is convinced that the CIA is sort of orchestrating Navalny, I think there's a danger in, in us sort of adopting similar glasses to look at problems in our politics, um, which, which I think are 95% are, are, are domestic in origin. And obviously if, if there are 5% stemming from abroad, we ought to, to take steps to deal with them. And that might mean passing legislation or focusing more on the issue, but um, but, but I guess that, that would be my sense of what, what the balance is in terms of where we ought to focus our resources, 95% at home and 5% and on, um, on, on finding potential foreign connections. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think that was such a great answer. Um, I cannot skip this next question because we, we have a long tradition of uh, running a Baltic initiative at FPRI. So we get this question quite often and I feel like it's kind of our job to answer it as many times as we can. Um, so this is about uh, you know, Russia's plans in the Baltics. Um, is it likely that the Russian authorities focus on the domestic opposition um, that's designed to move Western focus away from possible aggression against the Baltic countries? And I want to add to that another question. Uh, we spent a lot of time last year uh, writing our edited volume on uh, Russia's way of war in Syria, um, which um, everybody can access on our website also. It's a free ebook, uh, but uh, when we look at the future of Russia's designs, perhaps to intervene somewhere or attack another, yet another country, um, you know, Chris, what's your take on this? Do you think that Russia has its eye on some other place, whether it's the Baltics or somewhere else? You're muted, though. On, on domestic politics, I, I tend to think that we, we ought to first turn towards domestic political explanations for why Russia does things at home. Um, there are links obviously between foreign policy and domestic politics, but I think it, it's, it's, it can be a, a fatal error to underestimate the role of paranoia in driving uh, Russian leaders' decision-making at home. Um, I, I just finished a, a book on, um, on the history of Russian foreign policy. And one of the chapters looked at, at, um, at Stalin's foreign policy. And one of the things that's really striking about Stalin is the extent to which it's all the documentation we have. Just he, he, Stalin really believed that there were Polish conspiracies and Japanese conspiracies and Romanian conspiracies and all, all of Russia's neighbors conspiring to overthrow him uh, and working with, with top Communist Party members in the process. And it's, it's no doubt true that the Japanese and the Poles and Romanians would have loved to see Stalin toppled. But the thesis that, that these were major forces in, in Russian domestic politics was, is, in hindsight, looks bizarre and yet it was really genuinely believed at the time and I think if we want to understand how Russian leaders see the world today we ought to assume uh, that 
that they're they're more fearful for their hold on power at home than we think they ought to be, which which would explain why someone like Navalny might face attempted assassination, even though, as Stephanie outlined at the outset, um, he was already kept far away from winning any elections. Um, so I, I think that's the, the the primary driver of Russia's domestic politics decisions are their own is their own fear about their ability to keep holding power, um, which is not anything that's new to the current inhabitants of the Kremlin. It's it's sort of a long tradition in Russian politics. Um, so that that's I think how I would how I would would read the the, the treatment of Navalny right now, rather than as a sort of a, a distraction from from foreign adventures. Um, and, and as to the question of where Russian foreign policy turns next, you know, I'm I'm not a believer that Russia has a sort of uh, game plan for countries that it wants to invade. I think it's much more opportunistic. Um, uh, seeing where there are crises, seeing where there's opportunity, uh, and Syria is a great example. I think if you talk to any Russian foreign policy expert in you know, 2010 and ask them, what's the probability that your country's military is operating in Syria in just a couple of years, most of them would have said that's a, you know, a highly unlikely idea. Uh, and, and, yet, uh, and yet here we are today where Russia's military is a major player uh, in, in the Syrian conflict and will be for the foreseeable future. Um, so I, I think the question is actually, where are there likely to be crises along Russia's uh, borders or in areas that Russia seizes in, within its own um, sphere of, uh, of interest or sphere of influence? And those are the places where Russia is likely to, or potentially um, going to be uh, trying to assert itself in a bigger role. An example of this, I think, is in, in, in the South Caucasus, where we saw a, a war last year that uh, came as, as something of a surprise. There was sort of an, an, a, a ceasefire that had been roughly respected for some time, and a, a big war broke out. And, and uh, you can argue that Russia used that to insert itself in a bigger way um, into, in particular, Armenian politics. Um, so, so I would be asking the question of where are the crises likely to emerge, and then how is Russia going to respond to the crises? Uh, not sort of what is what is Russia's roadmap for? Um, you know, it, it, I think it's wrong to think Russia has a five-year plan for um, what it's going to do next, and then what step it'll take after that uh, in terms of dominating its neighborhood. Thank you, Chris. Um, Stephanie, I want to come to you with this next question. Um, it's it's about uh, Russia-EU relations, essentially. Um, though the focus for today's discussion is on US-Russia relations, what role do you think EU might play out in this matter? Um, can the EU be a powerful ally for the Biden administration to pressure Russia? But also, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, Russia EU relations, where where that stands now, um, and and um, you know how that how that might change as as you know the Biden administration reengages uh, with with the EU. Sure. So, I think the Biden administration is eager to work a little bit more with the EU, more so than the Trump administration did, for instance, in trying to hold. Russia accountable for various actions like the poisoning of Navalny and then his subsequent imprisonment. So one thing that we actually did see was that after it became known that Navalny was poisoned by a military grade nerve agent, um, the EU went ahead and imposed sanctions on a handful of inner regime members. Um, and the US at that point had just decided not to do that. Um, so I think that there's uh, there's a sense now that the US and the EU are going to work a little bit more in tandem in a potential sanctions policy in response to um, any Russian aggression or human rights violations at home. Um, one of the main questions for Russia EU relations right now is actually the question of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which uh, the United States has tried to kill and pretty effectively um, halted construction on that pipeline for the past year and a half now. Um, so the thing with the EU, though, is that there's, there, there is tension within the EU. There's disagreement between certain members as to how to respond to Russia. Um, and that's always something that, since its decisions are made on consensus there, it's, it's difficult to, um, sometimes you have to take into account the individual players. So you can see that, you know, in France, for instance, Macron tried to reach out to Russia and, you know, try to reset the relationship a little bit. I think he felt spurned after doing that. Um, so for instance, he hosted the Normandy format um, for the EU, Ukraine, or sorry, the Russia-Ukraine talks last year. Um, so I think that there's some, uh, France is taking a slightly more hawkish line towards Russia now as a result of those efforts. Um, and then there's Germany, which is an, another major player. And Germany has said that they are, you know, not ruling out any sanctions with regard to Russia and the poisoning of Navalny. And obviously Germany is where Navalny recovered from his poisoning and Merkel actually went and visited him in the hospital um, 
Navalny has been quite cagey about what they actually talked about, but um, it sounds like they had a, a, a long discussion. Um, at the same time, Germany has, and particularly Merkel herself, has been really protective of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And they're saying that um, this is not a political project and we need gas. And this, we, we need to view this as separate from all these other political issues. Um, but that's a really major sticking point within EU's, the EU's relationship with, um, with Russia. There are a lot of countries like Poland, for instance, that really oppose Nord Stream 2. Obviously the Baltics are very hawkish on Russia. Um, but then you have other countries like Bulgaria and Italy that tend to take um, a softer line towards Russia. So I think when you're looking at the EU's response and general EU-Russia relations, sometimes you have to break it down into the different countries and see how um, the various member states are responding to Russia and Russia's actions. Um, thank you, Stephanie. I, I want to uh, come back to you with with this additional question uh, from from uh, Bob Friedman. Does Navalny's ability to get in to get the info he showed on the Putin Palace video indicate that there are cracks in the elite? Now um, we know that you know he's he's gotten these videos, uh, the, this footage through you know drones, and also has gotten a hold of. Um, you know, the design plans, things like that. But um, do we know anything about, you know, how else he has received some of this footage and information and could it could it have come out of uh, Putin's inner circle? So I, I don't think that it shows the cracks in the elite, but I, I do think it shows the incompetence in some of Russia's security apparatus. And one thing that in, if you look at Bellingcat's investigations or the insider's investigations, which is a Russian investigative um, outlet as well, is that you can buy vast amounts of information on the Russian black market. You can get data sets on you know, um, airline passenger information. You can get data sets on traffic information. And so Navalny's team and a lot of the people who do open source investigative work in Russia, they purchase these data sets. Um, and that, that doesn't show uh, cracks within the regime. It just shows that the information is not well protected and can be sold online readily. Um, and then the other thing, you know, the other investigation that was really notable was when um, Navalny released a video saying, I called my poisoner and he admitted to everything. And so what happened there was that he prank called by um, kind of spoofing the number on his phone. He prank called some of the FSB individuals who were on that poison squad. And he managed to get one of these people, you know, who was initially a little bit hesitant about talking talking to him, but he, Navalny made up a persona of someone at the FSB and said, you know, we're, we're filing a report, we need your information about this, what happened, what went wrong, and, and he got this person to, you know, reveal a lot of information, and I think that that is really where the problem lies, it's not that elites are saying, you know, we're not sure about Putin anymore, let's give Navalny some information, it's that the system itself already has a lot of cracks in it, and um, if you know how to exploit those cracks, then you can get some really useful information, which Navalny's team and Bellingcat and other Russian investigative journalists have managed to do. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I want to come to Chris with this last question. So all of this has unfolded in Russia over the past few months, the protests, the, the controversies, all the drama, um, seemingly uh, you know, if you, if you watch the, the Russian news, it's like uh, we're not living uh, amidst a global pandemic. A uh, big part of this is that this summer, Russia announced it, that it, it had um, made a vaccine, Sputnik V. So every time you turn on, um, you know, Russia Today, you'll hear about all the jolly lines of, of you know, happy people waiting to get vaccinated for free or how Russia is now sending vaccine to Venezuela. It's doing so well at home already. Um, but uh, obviously that's not that's not quite the case. And Russia too, just like the rest of the world, um, you know, is experiencing this pandemic. Um, how do you anticipate um, the, the pandemic will continue to affect Russia during 2021? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think you're right, Maya, that Russia's had a worse pandemic than, than many countries. The data is, in every country, it's, it's sort of hard to be confident that we're counting cases correctly and counting infections correctly. But I think in Russia, we have the added 
variable that it, it does seem like there was a pretty concerted effort, at least in certain regions, not necessarily in Moscow, to suppress um, case counts, uh, especially early on. So, it, so it's not all exactly clear how bad the pandemic was in Russia, but it, it, it seems like it was quite bad. Uh, and, and I actually think still probably is, although it's, it's uh, I, my understanding is that it's, it's getting substantially better over the past couple of weeks. Um, I think that there's two interesting things about this. One is that um, unlike in many countries, uh, the Russian government has not gotten a lot of public blame for its handling of the pandemic. Uh, it's not like the US where it's been a key political issue or many European countries. Um, the, the government's been able to shield itself from getting blamed for it. I, I think in part because it seemed uh, accurately or not that Russia was doing no worse than average. Um, and in part because the, the media environment was such that the pandemic was treated as a something that happened to Russia rather than something that the, the government could to a certain extent control or at least mitigate with effective policy. Um, I think that the interesting big effect of the pandemic is that uh, it adds on to what had already been happening, which is uh, a steady erosion of Russian living standards. So R Russians today, when you adjust for inflation, are uh, almost 15% poorer than they were uh, in 2013, uh, seven or eight years ago. And most of that's not due to the pandemic. Most of that's due to uh, the past couple of years of, of, of economic stagnation. But the pandemic is an additional factor um, that's weighing very heavily on Russian living standards. And unlike in, in many countries like the US, where uh, the government response was to um, uh, undertake a number of programs that would increase household incomes as a response. In Russia, there was very little of that. So the government hasn't helped uh, the average Russian um, in, a, in a substantial way in response to the pandemic. So Russians are a lot poorer today than they were uh, a decade ago. And I think that is going to have a really important effect in the long run on Russian support for the regime. We already see this to a certain extent on polling about do you trust Putin? Uh, those numbers have fallen um, uh, meaningfully, not not catastrophically, but meaningfully uh, in, in recent months. Uh, and, and I think that's where uh, the, the Russian government and the Russian political class ought, ought to be worried. Uh, unlike the first decade that Putin was in power, where he could say, uh, I've made you better off. The last decade, the truth is the opposite. And although uh, that doesn't make the news very often in Russia, most Russians feel it because it, it hits their household personally. So that's, I think, a big issue for Russia, not probably this year, but over the coming years, it's going to impose uh, increasing dilemmas for Russian policymakers. Thank you, Chris, Stephanie. Um, thank you so much for joining us and answering all these questions. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have today, but I want to also thank um, our audience for, for tuning in and for asking these great questions. Um, I want to encourage everyone to become a member of FPRI if they are not already, and also sign up for our emails, register for our BMB Russia newsletter to keep up with these stories. Um, and uh, I wish everyone a good day and a, and a nice weekend.